Great. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, for your presentation, as well as Mindy and Manavana for all of your presentations and taking time to answer questions. So for all of our participants, if you have a question for the speakers, please go ahead and put it in the chat pod on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And we will um, share those with the speakers and hopefully get to your question. And I want to let everyone know we actually have Daniela Berthilli uh, joining us for the panel. And they're from the Office of Biotechnology Products in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality in Cedar. And so I want to welcome Daniela, who may be also answering questions. Our first question is for Mindy. Mindy, is there a way to request assistance from the FDA if we're not sure whether the proposed peptide product can be submitted as an ANDA or whether it should be submitted as a 505B2 application? Hi, Lisa. Thanks. Um, sure. So there are two potential pathways to get guidance back from FDA if you have a question in that regard. And one is through controlled correspondence. And the second way would be through a pre and a meeting uh, request. And there are actually two draft guidances that are published that can give you more information on both of those. One of them is the controlled correspondence related to generic drug development guidance. And the other one is the formal meetings between FDA and ANDA applicants of complex products under the DUFA. So you can refer to those guidances for more details on how those pathways work. Great. Thank you, Mindy. Um, our next question for you is, you mentioned that peptides were not subject to the transition provision, but you also referenced peptides that do not otherwise meet the definition of a biological product. What is an example of a peptide that would meet the definition of a biological product? I'm um, sure. So um, a peptide product that is a vaccine would be an example of a peptide that meets the definition of biological product and would therefore be regulated under Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act. Thank you, Mindy. And our next question is for Mani Vana. So Mani, the first question for you is, we need to provide the genotoxic impurity assessment for peptide-related impurities. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, in the DMF, uh, I don't think uh, we need to, they need to provide any genotoxic assessment for peptide-related impurities. As you know, ICHM7 doesn't cover these peptides. However, if you are using any non-peptide molecules, such as reagents, solvents, catalysts in the manufacturing process, which has any structural alert uh, for genotoxicity, then I would say yes, they should provide a, a genotoxic assessment based on the ICHM7. Okay, great, thank you. We have another question for you. What type of physical chemical properties are necessary to include in the DMF for RLD sameness? Yeah, basically we wanted to, you know, uh, compare the drug substance with the RLD by basic uh, characterization, physical chemical properties like solubility, melting point, hygroscopicity of the drug substance. And, uh, Chiral, since it is a chiral molecule, then we have to know that, you know, specific chiral location or anything about the chirality. And uh, in addition, we need IR and UV spectra. So it depends on the, it varies with the API. And basically, we need all these uh, solubility, melting point, hygroscopicity, specific optical rotation, IR, UV. These are all basic characterizations we need for acceptance in the DMI. All right, thank you so much. Our next question is for Eric. Eric, if impurities are above the threshold of 0.5% of and are higher than the RLD, what qualification studies are recommended by the agency? Is it acceptable if we justify using negative in silico or in vitro immunogenicity assays? 
Additionally, we note that the levels are allowed up to 0.5%. Can the specification be set up to 0.5 and the subject Uh, thanks, meaning for the question. So I'll just like to uh, clarify that. So the question is for uh, certain impurities that's above the 0.5 percent, um, and that's you know above the recommended limit for the guidance. Uh, what do we do about these? Um, I, I think uh, if it's above 0.5 percent and that's also above the RODs, then um, first of all we would have to you know uh, we'll recommend that you actually look at these impurities and see if we can. Uh, control them to a you know reasonable level, but at the same time understand that you know we're looking at uh, these applications at a highly purified state. So uh, think about you know how to purify your your sample so you can get it down to that point. Then using negative um, using assays to justify that, I think uh, it really depends on what your uh, what this impurity is. Um, you know. I think you will have to do some sort of a risk assessment and provide additional justification besides the in silico in vitro assay, um, maybe supported by you know um, literature search or something else to to show that you know these impurities will not have um, safety or efficacy risk. Um, so uh, you know um, I don't know Danilo if you have anything to chime in, but um, that's it. Um, yes, I, I would agree. I think that um, if there are impurities that are present at higher than 0.5%, it becomes a review issue that we, we look at it in terms of what its potential impact is on safety and efficacy uh, and immunogenicity and would have to have sort of a more case-by-case -case, um, response. All right, great. Thank you, Eric and Danielle, for answering the question. We have another question for Eric. Is it correct that immunogenicity is needed for synthetic peptides in all cases? Can you cite examples where immunogenicity studies for synthetic peptides are not required for an ANDA application? Um, so just to clarify that in, uh, the in vitro and silico, these immunogenicity assay were um, you know, developed for these five peptides. Uh, that are referencing recombinant peptides. So um, the guidance and everything else, uh, everything in the guidance is applied uh, to these five peptides. However, um, you know, one can say, you know, do we borrow the sterile guidance for any other product? I think that really depends, um, you know, the risk of the product and, you know, also the risk of your development program. Uh, I think for many of these smaller peptides, um, you know, give examples such as uh, Kaidaban, Perhaps you know the the drug product itself is low risk and may not need um, these in vitro or you know immunogenicity assessment. But uh, you know at the end of the day, it really depends on the you know totality of evidence that you know that suggests whether the product itself is uh, immunogenic uh, in nature or has the potential to cause immunogenicity, and what are the risks, uh, whether you know the manufacturing or what other risks potentially are there. Then um, you know we would determine whether these are needed. But for the five peptides that are outlined in the guidance, yes, those need immunogenicity assessment. For other peptides, it depends. And I don't know, Danella, if you have anything else. No, I agree. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Manny. Does identification and characterization of impurities, does that request information of site of modification or only type of modification? It depends on the amount of impurity they observe. Um, so for example, if they're uh, observing about more than 0.10, minimum they should establish that. And I chart them as, you know, as showing that this is if it is more, if it is ever specifying those impurities in their specification, they should completely character that uh, impurity. And we want to know the structure of the impurity if they are specifying it. Great, thank you. 
Our next question is for the general panel. So do we need a negative or positive control in the T cell assay? Immunogenic response may not be proportionate, proportionate every time with the amount of peptide. Okay, so we have Daniela or Eric, can you answer at all? Yeah, I was, I'm sorry, I was rereading um, the, the question. Um, yes, you always need positive and negative controls for all your assays. That's part of validating the assay and ensuring that it is um, sensitive uh, to the degree um, that you think it is. Um, so yes, uh, you always need positive and negative controls on a T cell assay. And, and um, one of the issues that we have seen with the DC T cell assay is that people have been using, uh, so, so these assays are, are designed to assess a naive T cell response. So a first response uh, of the subject to a new peptide that it sees for the first time. And uh, many times we've seen uh, that instead sponsors use as a control um, a what is called a recall response to, to some you know very common um, antigen like people use um, a, 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 a um, tetanus toxin response or something that people have been vaccinated with um, to elicit a very strong response. Um, so that kind of, of uh, control, even though it's it's adequate to show that the assay, that the cells are alive and the, and the assay is kind of working, it doesn't really tell us much about the sensitivity of the assay to capture a naive or a first. Great, thank you so much. Um, and our next question again is for Daniela. Why is endotoxin testing not sufficient to assess innate immune response modulating impurity? Do we always have to test for IR, IIRM? So um, the, you have to understand that there's different um, assays test for, for different things. So endotoxin is just one impurity that may be present in the product. It's um, usually of, of a microbial origin, but there can be other impurities that can function as irritant or, or as uh, pyrogen activating different receptors in the tissue. Um, but the end result may, and may, may be the same. They might still lead to uh, inflammation in the tissue, which leads to an increasing number of immune cells that go to the site where the product is deposited, and then um, they can initiate an, an immune response. They get activated, they, they initiate an immune response. So we want uh, broader uh, a testing uh, for uh, things that could activate the innate immune cells that is broader than just endotoxin. And the toxin, you know, has historically been used as the canary in the landmine uh, in, in the mine. But 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 um, I think that the we we have now the technology to do a much more comprehensive assessment of um, innate immune response modulating impurities um, and. It is very helpful when looking at um, doing the risk assessment. Great, thank you so much. Our last question is going to be for Eric. Do immunoassays, are they required for all peptides? Sorry, I realized I was muted. Um, yes, so our, I think I probably answered this question uh, just now. The, um, no, the, the immunogenous assays are not required for all peptides. Um, you know, for, uh, like I said, it really depends on the risk. And also, it is required for the five peptides that are listed uh, in the guidance. Um, so that, that's my answer. Okay, great. And thank you to all of our speakers and panelists for your time and 